while we're waiting for uh, uh, Valeri to come back in, uh, let me also say, of course, that um, as I announced on my blog and several other places, uh, we are we are intending for this to be a series, which I called Every Proof Assistant, where uh, the word proof assistant has to be understood in a very, um, in a, in a very um, loose way. So uh, we hope to have more seminars like this um, in which we're going to present proof assistants uh, and ideas that are behind them. Where is Valeri? This is just really okay. We can hear you now. Really? Yeah, I think so. Um, okay. you, can see, you, can, you can see the screen, and you can yes, hear. we can see the screen. We can hear you, and that's it. I think. Yeah, great. So we can start. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, <laughs> so um, uh, so I will just uh, use this um, idea to. Uh, idea to show uh, the presentation instead of slides or anything like that because I can show you the code and uh, uh, various features at the same time right so let me just uh, uh, begin with uh, description general description of the language um, so basically it's just uh, uh, a multity uh, a variation of uh, multity uh, but it has all the standard features which uh, uh, which are present in other proof systems like that. So in particular, it has uh, inductive types and uh, functions and recursive functions. So I just quickly show you this just to, so that you will be familiar with the syntax and just to get started, right? So here we have a, a Boolean type which has two constructors. So uh, constructors are defined like this. Uh, if uh, they have parameters, then uh, they define like this. So the syntax is the syntax is like uh, Haskell, more or less. Uh, so here, here we have uh, this data type, um, which is again defined as usual: two constructors, uh, empty list, and uh, cons uh, list with a head. So um, here, um, how we can define uh, functions? Um, uh, of course, we can define functions uh, like ordinary functions uh, like that, like constants or something like that. Um, and we can, uh, if it takes a parameter, then uh, we can do it like this. So here we have a data function of natural numbers. And uh, uh, so if we want to make it uh, polymorphic, then again, we can do it as usual uh, like that. Uh, it has uh, implicit arguments like a lambda or any other system actually. Um, so uh, here's an example of a uh, function defined by what you matching. Um, so here we have a function that takes a list and if it is a, uh, new, it turns true. If it is non empty, it turns false. And here's an example of a recursive, fun recursive function that uh, concatenates to lists. Uh, again, standard definition, nothing interesting. So, uh, but uh, here's something <laughs> interesting. Uh, we don't actually have um, uh, data types with indices. So, for example, the standard way to define uh, data identity type is, would be uh, uh, using uh, data types with indices, but we don't have them because uh, they uh, doesn't really work well with uh, commodity. Uh, Stuff right, unless we uh, we are careful, so we don't have them uh, at all. But uh, instead, uh, we have uh, a different way. Uh, there is a question, I think. Yes, I didn't actually mute everybody. So if there is a question, you can speak up. And only when things get unwieldy will I start becoming more of a dictator. I unmuted everyone, Andre. So. Uh -huh. That's oh, fine. you did. Okay, we already have a dictator. If there was a question, is it possible to increase the font? Uh, increase oh, on the screen. Yeah, it's very small. Mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, maybe it is, but I don't want to uh, do it right now because it will break something. Probably. I don't know. I don't want to. It's too anything. risky. 
Yes. I mean, okay. if I just try to do something, it will probably, I don't know, Zoom will freak out or something, maybe. Okay, sorry, Yulia, that's a no. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, well, anyway, um, so, but uh, we don't have a types of indices, but we have another way of defining uh, such uh, data types. So basically the idea, here's the standard example of vectors of lists of given length. So uh, basically the idea is that we can define the types also by pattern matching like functions. So here we match on the uh, n parameter and if it is zero, then we say that the type has only one constructor new and if it is uh, sac, then it has again only one constructor cons. So basically there is only one vector of length zero and only one well, constructor for vectors of none. Zero length. So here, <laughs> a very simple idea, and it works um, pretty well. For example, here we can define head, tail, and all, all other functions like that. Uh, since uh, the data type here um, is a vector of length sac of n, then it only has one constructor. So we don't need to uh, consider the other case. Actually, we don't even can do this because. We can do this because uh, it's not a constructor of this type, it's a constructor of type vector back of zero. Well, anyway, so here we can, how we can like replace the type with indices with this stuff. Uh, uh, there are some restrictions, for example, you can define identity types in this way because you would need to uh, have the same variable uh, on the left hand side. Uh, here in patterns, but it doesn't make sense to have the same variable on the left hand side. Um, so you can define data types in this way. Um, so yeah, here's the basic stuff. Uh, let's uh, move on to something more interesting. So Iron has a class system, um, uh, which is kind of, um, so basically, uh, uh, a class uh, is just like a sigma type, but with named fields, right? Um, so, uh, it, but there are more features on top of that. So for example, uh, every uh, class in Arnd is also uh, like a type class in uh, Haskell, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and if not, that basically means that, um, uh, that uh, you can, uh, it, it's easier to, to explain this uh, on a, as an example, right? So for example, if you have a monoid uh, class, uh, so monoid is just uh, consists of a set, an, an element, function, and some properties. So now uh, I can just write, uh, uh, so formally this function actually takes uh, not two arguments, but actually three arguments. The first one is uh, the instance of the monoid. So it just takes an instance of monoid and returns the corresponding function. But here we don't, we don't specify it explicitly because it's inferred uh, automatically. So it just takes this instance in this case. Uh, so that's the basic idea. So basically you can write, uh, uh, don't have to explicitly specify instances. Again, this is uh, standard stuff, uh, but uh, here's something interesting. Uh, so uh, there's uh, like a very like, famous, famous problem in uh, the uh, independent type languages that uh, you always have to decide how you will define your uh, classes. So what I mean is that uh, when I define a class like that, I can, uh, uh, for example, uh, put everything in fields. So for example, I can do it like this. So uh, underline set is a field and uh, this uh, element is a field, this is a field and, and so on. And, but I can also put something in parameters like this or I can put more stuff in parameters like this and so on, so on. So uh, the problem is, uh, the question is, uh, what should I put into parameters and what should I put uh, in fields? And so in Ireland, uh, this question 
is not really important because classes uh, don't have fields, uh, parameters. Uh, I mean, when you write it like this, this is not actually a parameter, it's just a syntactic sugar, it's actually a field. So everything is field. So how does this, this work? Well, um, since everything is a field, uh, you, you cannot have parameters. So for example, mm, uh, here uh, we have a function uh, which takes a monoid. So uh, the type monoid is the type of all monoids together with the underlying set. So we take a monoid, take a few elements, and then do some stuff with them, right? Uh, but now, uh, uh, if I want to consider not uh, the type of all monoids, but just monoid structures on some specific type, for example, the type of natural numbers, then you can write this. So basically, every class works as if it was defined in uh, the first style or the second style or the third or any style. So you can just have uh, the type, uh, the class without parameters or the class with specified uh, some of the parameters where some of the parameters are fixed like this. So again, here um, I have a function that takes a structure, monoid structure on natural numbers and again, do some stuff with it. Or for example, I can consider monoid structures on natural numbers in which the unit is zero. So now I can use uh, unit and zero interchangeably because uh, I just specified that unit is zero, so they are actually definitionally equal. Valery, okay. I have a question. Right. Can you specify here in this example, you specified nat and zero. Um, so can, do you always have to specify the parameters in order? That is to say you have to fix the first one and then the no. second one, or could you fix just some of them? No, you can fix some of them. There are another syntax for this. You can, uh, so for example, uh, this one is equivalent to the, uh, this code. This type is actually the same. Uh -huh. This is just a shorter version, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you want to specify, for example, this function, then you can, do it like this. Okay, so here we have a uh, type where the binary operation is the addition of natural numbers. Okay, okay thank you. Um, yeah, but uh, there are some restrictions. For example, uh, I cannot uh, fix this one without fixing this one because it depends on that, so it doesn't really make sense. Okay. Um, uh, so and, uh, another example, for example, um, here I defined a class of uh, posets, right? Uh, so for example, if I want to consider some set which has uh, a structure of a monoid and a structure of a set, I can just do it like this. Uh, I just accept set and structure of monoid, structure of a set, and uh, do some stuff with it. Multiple elements compared with another one. So um, yeah, uh, very simple, very convenient. Uh, don't have to worry about this problem at all. So the next thing is that uh, classes uh, can be inherited. So uh, you can have uh, some class and you can extend it, add some new fields to it like this. Uh, and we also can uh, implement some old fields. For example, in this case, uh, we can actually prove one of the properties uh, using new field and uh, old properties that you have, right? So now uh, when we construct a commutative monoid, we uh, don't have to prove this property every time because we proved it here. Um, and also nice thing is that this type, uh, this uh, type class inference mechanism works well with uh, inheritance. So this means that, uh, for example, if I have an instance of a commutative monoid, then it also will be automatically an instance of monoid, uh, which sounds uh, kind of obvious, but it doesn't actually work in Haskell in that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, here's an example of an instance. Uh, uh, so to define instance, again, is just a function. Uh, 
so you can just implement it like an ordinary function. So uh, right here, something like uh, this, right? So, uh, but there is a special uh, syntax, which is more convenient, just uh, define them by call pattern matching uh, like this. Uh, let me scroll down. Um, so yeah, we can, uh, and here we need to prove this stuff and define, but I won't do this right now. And then we can use uh, this instance, which is uh, inferred as usual. So yeah, uh, here are, Um, uh, here's um, this part. Let's move on. Um, ah, yeah. So, um, as you can see, I'm working in IDE, uh, which is also uh, developed um, uh, here at Space Research. Uh, and actually, they are very, uh, they are implemented at the same time, and uh, IDE uses. Uh, the compiler, the top checker, uh, very uh, intricate way, so to say. So uh, it doesn't have to communicate with some external program. It just invokes everything internally, which is very convenient. Um, yeah, anyway, um, there are a lot of features. I just uh, listed a few of them. You can see that uh, there, are, there is some collecting, right? Uh, completion. Uh, I'm not sure I showed that, uh, let me. Uh, so of course, completion works, right? So um, uh, you can see uh, even type signatures and stuff like that. Um, uh, go to declaration is, uh, of course, also works. You can uh, always go to the definition. And uh, quick documentation just shows uh, uh, some information about this definition, which is also convenient if you don't want to go to the definition itself. Uh, uh, here it even shows the description that I wrote here. Uh, so yeah, um, what else do we have? Find usages is also very convenient. Uh, so this works like this. Uh, if I have some definition, I can just find all the usages in the library, so you can uh, see it right here. We have five usages, and uh, you can look at them, go to to them. I won't do this right now. Um, this is actually uh, can be used to just uh, uh, if you want to uh, like find some uh, lemma about some uh, data type or whatever, you can just look for usages of this data type and. Uh, you can find your lemma. Uh, it's not very advanced uh, in this respect, but uh, kind of works. Another very useful way, another very useful feature is auto import. This is um, uh, basically when you uh, don't know where some definition is defined or don't uh, want to explicitly uh, import it. So now Pink is not imported, but uh, ID says that, and uh, you can just press it like this, and yeah, um, it uh, added this line. It wasn't here before. Um, so I actually never uh, write explicitly those import commands. ID just does this always for me. Um, but the background type checking is also uh, very convenient. So as you can see, uh, it automatic automatically checks everything as I type. So um, here we can see some errors and you know, stuff like that. Uh, some people don't like this and it actually can be turned off if you don't like this. Um, but it works uh, pretty well, uh, even on my old computer. Uh, because it doesn't have to really check everything, it just checks the last function. So for example, when I modify this function, you can see here on the left that something happening, oh, sorry. Uh, something happening to this function, but uh, those functions uh, are not changed, so it, it won't be check them. So this works pretty fast. 
Um, yeah, and there are various quick fixes like refactorings and stuff like that. Uh, so, for example, I already showed you the one, this one, when you are defining an instance, uh, you don't have to explicitly manually write all the fields. You can just uh, use this feature. You can also do this for automation, right? Uh, let's say uh, I want to define some function from that to that. And then I don't want to write more patterns. I can just again do this, or I can split this pattern. Uh, there is also refined features. For example, uh, uh, if I want to fill this goal, I can uh, just do this, like this, uh, and so on. Uh, so there are a lot of features like that. I won't talk much about them. Um, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, we have this um, um, ID support. Um, let's, let's talk about actually some homotopy uh, features, okay? Um, so first of all, I already mentioned that uh, we, we can define identity types as usual. So the, there must be some way to define them. And actually, they're just built in, and that's it. Uh, and it works like in uh, cubicle type theory is very similar, but uh, it has some differences. I will talk about this later. Uh, so basically, the, the basic idea of how it works is that we have, uh, again, a built-in uh, type, which we call the interval. Uh, it's slightly unusual because uh, it has two constructors, but its eliminator is not bool eliminator, it's actually the unit eliminator. So even though it has two constructors, it behaves like a unit type, a particular disk contractible, because the eliminator is wrong, the wrong one. <laughs> okay, so he he here it is. Uh, it is literally the unit eliminator. Uh, again, it is built in, so you can define actually this function if uh, without using the built in one. Uh, I just uh, copy pasted here just to show uh, how it looks. Um, yeah, and the Sorry. and um, uh, the path type uh, is defined simply as the type of uh, functions from the interval type to the given type A, such that. Uh, its values on the endpoints, uh, the given one. So, the, uh, yeah, the type. Uh, basically, it's literally just subtype or subset, whatever, uh, of the type of functions uh, which satisfy this, these properties. So, um, yeah, and again, as I said, it is built in. So, <clears throat> uh, to turn a function like this into uh, a path, you just use this constructor and to turn a path into the function, you use this function. Uh, it is an uh, infix operator, so it is usually used in infix form. Uh, if you just uh, take this argument and put right here, it will be uh, written in infix, right? So, um, and yeah, that's basically it. Uh, that's the whole the theory, well, apart from high index types and invariants. Uh, the nice property um, of this theory is that um, some, some functions can be defined uh, simply uh, and they satisfy some additional uh, computational properties. For example, we can actually define functional extensionality like this. So here's the definition. It is actually shorter than the signature. <laughs> um, and the nice thing is that we not, we not only can define this uh, function, but actually those two types, equality and pointwise equality, they're not just equivalent, they are actually isomorphic. So this function is actually isomorphism. So you can define function in the opposite, opposite direction. So the composition are literally, definitionally equals to identity. Well, okay. 
Um, yeah, uh, also we can define the J operator. So it is indeed uh, a data type. This is not actually obvious. Uh, the, uh, from this simple uh, description, we can derive this kind of complicated operator, but we can. Um, uh, so here we use the, the, the eliminator for the interval and some uh, magic function that I won't define. It's kind of complicated, but you can define it. Um, so, and I actually think that uh, this definition is actually uh, simpler than the usual definition of identity types. We just have this simple uh, type, then uh, the type of path, which is very natural from a homotopical point of view, and that's it. We don't, don't have anything complicated like that. I can just define it. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, another nice um, uh, feature is that you can actually define uh, functions over path types just by automation with the reflexivity proof, so to say, right? With the trivial path. That's the way I, the usual definition of identity types work. Uh, but uh, when we define path, type, path, path types like this, it shouldn't work because it's defined in, uh, in a different way, but we actually make it work so that it is very uh, convenient to just find function like this. And I want to show you just one example, um, which I think will, <laughs> I will prove that it is actually very important and convenient that we have this, um, uh, this feature. So let me just open uh, another proof. So here we have uh, a proof of the generalized blockers Bicely theorem. And uh, uh, let me just show one part of this proof. We need to construct uh, an equivalence between uh, some types. So we have function which goes in one direction, function which goes in the other direction, and the proof that they are mutually inverse. So those four functions, here they are. Yeah, they fit on the screen. Uh, so they use this feature a lot. If you just count uh, all these uh, IDPs on the left hand side, uh, uh, I think there are 38 of them. So just imagine defining uh, these functions using 38 applications of the J rule. Yeah, it would be a nightmare, I think. <laughs> so I think this is very actually important that we have this uh, feature. Um, yeah, let me go back to my presentation. Um, yeah, and finally, uh, let me talk about univalence. Um, Again, it is just some built-in like function. It's not actually a function. It's uh, sort of a, just a new type, so to say. Uh, but basically, it just says that if if you have um, uh, like an equivalence, uh, then we have a path between uh, those types. Uh, and also, it satisfies this property that if we transport along this path then we get the original function. And this holds just definitionally. Again, this is just some built-in functionality. Uh, so again, it's not obvious that invalence falls from these two rules, but it actually is. Uh, you can prove this. So here, uh, uh, my comparison with the cubical type theories. So the Hot I, that's the name of the underlying theorem, hot um, type theory with an integral type. Uh, so uh, it has actually simpler rules than cubical type theories, at least I think so. Uh, so it doesn't have canonicity. Um, I think that it is possible to uh, add more computational rules so that it have this property, but I'm not sure. Uh, this, this is not obvious, actually. Uh, 
So it has this um, regularity property, which basically means that Jasper along the constant family is, uh, is the additive function, right? Uh, which in particular means that we can uh, use this uh, feature. Uh, it's pretty much on NDP. And uh, there are some problems with this property in cubical type theories. I think, I don't, I think that there are currently no known cubical type theory with this property. Um, so also I was told that this property uh, does not hold definitionally in cubical type theories. I'm not sure about this one, but, uh, um, but it is very convenient property. So, and, and, and finally, um, cubical type theories um, have some uh, restricted class of models, like uh, in cubical sets and some cubical, I don't know, pre shifts or shifts, I know. But uh, um, actually, I'm not that familiar uh, with them. But uh, our theory uh, has um, basically every standard model of uh, ordinary uh, type theory, uh, homotopy type theory is, a, is also a model of uh, this one, almost. There are some minor additional uh, assumptions, but more or less. Yes, there are some questions. Uh, hello. Um, are you aware of any downsides of this um, type theory compared to CTT? Um, this one doesn't have chronicity, basically the, uh, only, yeah, okay, fine. the, the only property, the, the most important one of uh, chemical type theory is, is chronicity and uh, this one doesn't have it. Um, yeah, but as I said, um, I think that we can add more rules. Actually, we can add them right now, but the problem is that uh, I, don't, I don't know if those models, well, I know that those models do not support them, so I don't want to add those additional uh, reduction rules. Uh, but I think that uh, they won't break anything, actually. Yeah, um, let's move on. Uh, sorry, I think there may be a question from Andy Pitts. Yes, um, Balaric, just is there somewhere where we can read about HOSI and its models? Uh, yeah, uh, good question. <laughs> and uh, I uh, just uh, yesterday or even today uploaded a short note on archive about this. So uh, let's. Uh, oh, I shouldn't do that. Uh, yeah, so there is a short note, just seven pages long, about models of this theory. Uh, you can so, so it's it's going to be on archive very soon. It, it is already. It ah, it's already there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, somebody posted a link to it on, in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So just a follow-up question. So, uh -huh. so my feeling about models of cubical type theory is they're hard work. Um, so so why is it not hard work to produce a model of hot eye, which seems oh. to be even better than cubical type theory? Because because of this line, since it, the rules are simpler than. Of course, it's easy to construct a model, right? And it has very simple rules, like uh, I just described them uh, here and here, and that's it. And, 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 and here, and that's it. Just three, three basically, uh, set of rules, so to say. Well, it's not, and it's not that easy to construct, actually. Because something has simple rules doesn't necessarily mean to say it's easy to find a model. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but... but you know. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, it, it is very easy to construct the impression of these two uh, uh, set of rules. Uh, and uh, it's not that easy for univalence, but you can do that. You can read this um, in the note. Uh, yeah, anyway, let's move on. Uh, so here I want to talk quickly about um, hand active types. Um, so again, they work more or less the same way as in cubical type theories. So we already saw that we can define functions by pattern matching and data types by pattern matching. So why not define constructors by pattern matching, right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yeah, uh, here we have uh, two constructors, base and loop, and loop is defined by pattern matching. Uh, I mean, not defined, just uh, um, has some uh, rules which, uh, and the syntax for the, them is just usual pattern matching. So when uh, this parameter is left, it, it reduces to base, I mean, loop of left reduces to base, and loop of right reduces to base. Uh, so they are definitionally equal loop of left and base, and loop of right and base. Uh, and yeah, in this way, you can define all the standard uh, find X types. So there are a few additional features uh, that we have. So, well, first of all, um, uh, uh, I didn't uh, talk about that because uh, I think I won't have time for that, but um, Arendt has um, uh, one additional, uh, not set of universes, but uh, there's the standard hierarchy of universes, right? But Arendt has additional axes. So there's a grid of universes and the second axis is just the homotopy level. Um, so in particular, there is a uh, universe of propositions, which is built in, and the universe of sets, and so on and so on. Um, uh, this is actually convenient because um, the language itself knows about the level. It is built in. It's not just some predicate defined in the theory. So we can use this information for various things um, that I show just uh, below. But um, so for example, uh, there is a built-in uh, way of defining truncated data types. Of course, you can use the standard construction, but uh, it is more convenient just to use this one. If you want to define truncated data type, you can put it in uh, some fixed uh, uh, universe of some homotopy level, like uh, in this case, I put it in propositions, but you can put it in set and so on. Um, so basically, it's defined just as ordinary data type. The only difference is the keyword here. And you can use it just as ordinary data type. The only restriction is that it can be eliminated only to uh, types of the given level, right? And also, I want to uh, say that uh, this uh, universe of propositions, uh, you can compare it to proposition, to this, to universe prop in, for example, Coq or Vin or other such systems, Agda, I think it also has prop, right? Um, so uh, here, prop is actually an honest uh, type of homotopy propositions. I mean, it is literally equivalent to the sub-universe consistent of homotopy propositions. It's not uh, equal to it, but it is equivalent to it. Um, so in particular, this means that uh, you can uh, actually not only get uh, into this universe, but you can also get <laughs> out of it in some sense. So it's not uh, as other systems where you cannot construct a function from a proposition to some set, for example, right? Here you can do this is an ordinary standard um, kind of uh, constructions, right? So, um, yeah. Um, uh, another feature that we have, have is that uh, when we define functions by pretty much um, on uh, high inductive types, if the uh, code domain is some truncated uh, type, then you can actually omit some of the uh, uh, some of the constructors if the level of the constructor is higher than the level of uh, this type in the code domain. So for example here, uh, I construct a proposition. Uh, so I just need to specify uh, the value for this constructor, but not for this one. Um, uh, yeah, it is actually very convenient. For example, <clears throat> uh, so this is just some uh, 
at her example, uh, but it is actually used, for example, in the proof of uh, encode the code for the circle and uh, in some other stuff like encode the code for pushouts, I think, also uses this. And uh, actually, it is also very convenient when you work with quotients. For example, if you want just to prove some property of uh, an arbitrary element in uh, the question, then you just need to uh, prove it for some representative from the original type, and that's it. You don't have to consider anything, uh, any additional uh, cases. And so if you want to prove some function of two arguments, then you need to consider only three cases instead, instead of four. Uh, and or even nine, if you define it uh, as a uh, truncated data type as usual, then you have three constructors. So you have nine case, case total. Um, but here you don't have to consider all them, just three cases and that's it. So the first one is the uh, definition for the represent representatives. The second one is that it respects the equivalence uh, on the first argument and the final one is that it respects equivalence in the second argument. Um, yeah, uh, so this is it. And final thing that I want to talk about is, uh, is the language extensions. This is the latest thing that we implemented just in the previous release. Uh, so, uh, so what what is it? Well, first of all, they mm, it is just some code written in Java. By the way, the language itself is written in Java, and in Kotlin partially. Uh, so um, you can write your own code in Java or in other JVM languages, and uh, and it will be um, so to say added to the language. So the nice thing is that. It's not just a plugin for the language, like in Coq, for example, uh, because uh, you can just implement it as a part of your library. Uh, you don't have to build it into the source code of the language. You just um, write some code. I can show you, for example, uh, here we have uh, some uh, code which is written here in the standard library. So uh, here is the rewrite tactic, so to say. Um, for example, if I want to add some uh, code uh, like this, so it prints some me message on the screen every time it is invoked, right? So now I just uh, compile it and uh, then reload libraries and that's it. So now when I invoke rewrite, it will, it will print this message. So I don't even have to restart IDE. Uh, it just uh, works like that, okay? Um, so it is uh, somewhere in between uh, plugins, which are like very heavyweight, and writing tactics in the language itself, like for example, how you do it in Lean or in Coq. Uh, here we, we write our tactics, our meta code in Java, but we can uh, very easily just uh, uh, build it and reload everything and, and use the, uh, use the res results. So um, let me open my presentation. Uh, so yeah, as I said, it can be used to write uh, some meta definition, right? So a meta definition is like a uh, macros in Lisp, for example, or as uh, uh, tactic in Coq or something like that. So basically, it's just a function that operates on terms themselves. So you can uh, implement some, uh, for example, idea cells that, uh, so those are just um, some, mm, some domain specific languages which are embedded in. Uh, in and uh, so they can I don't know uh, represent um, some for example languages for working with I don't know matrices so uh, 
some equations, I don't know, stuff like that. Uh, you can easily do this. Um, and also, of course, you can implement various solvers. So uh, I have an implementation of uh, monoid solver, uh, just uh, so that the examples of this, of course, I want to implement a ring solver and so on and so on, but I didn't do that yet. Um, and nice thing is that uh, th since these uh, solvers are implemented in Java, they can execute arbitrary code. In particular, they can just, for example, invoke some external program, some SAT solver or something like this, and use that to uh, solve your problem. Uh, they can also uh, interact with the user. So for example, if Taxix computes, computes something, and then it just uh, doesn't know what to do next, it has a few options that it can ask the user what to do next, and the user can say, do this, and then it can proceed with its computation. So just to give you a simple example, actually you already saw that. Uh, for example, when we write, oh, my time, run out, but I almost finished. So for example, when you... Uh, um, don't, don't worry, just go on. If you're yeah, uh, actually, this is the last thing I want to say. Uh, when you do this, um, well, let's say this one. Um, this uh, menu, item menu, is actually generated by uh, language extension, so by code written in the standard library. So when I choose this uh, menu, this stuff that uh, appears on the screen, again, is generated by a code in the standard library. And for example, if uh, I have a data type with several constructors, then uh, this one is actually very simple, it just tries to insert a constructor. So if the serial constructor, it uh, shows you this menu, and you can choose which one you want to insert. And yeah, so this menu is again shown to you by uh, some code in written in the standard library. So this way it interacts with the user. And of course, it's just a simple example. You can do something much more complicated than this. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to uh, find a way to clap. So uh, maybe uh, if I unmute everybody. <laughs> okay, I muted everybody now. So time for questions. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, Yuri has a question. I will unmute you and then you just ask. Yuri, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I have uh, a question which I asked in chat. Um, so, RAND is written in Java. Uh, does it have uh, some kind of formally verified core? And if not, are there any plans to do so? Thank you. Um, I, we don't have any, like, I, I thought about this, but uh, it's not the highest priority, so to say, but maybe, yes, someday. Okay, Patrick has a question. Um, wait, Mark, I think this is, there is an order to these things. So Mark, uh, go ahead. Mark, did you have a question? Mark Laws, you raised your hand. Okay, we'll go on with uh, Patrick. Patrick, you're unmuted. Thanks. Um, to what extent can we extract um, like computationally meaningful programs out of this? Like, um, even if we don't have canonicity, are there like is it possible to use this as an actual programming language for writing actual programs? Well, um, of course, if you write uh, some function which doesn't uh, use any non-computational stuff, then of course it, it can be executed as an ordinary function. Uh, so right now everything is just interpreted. Uh, 
you can potentially write a compiler for it, which just takes those functions and uh, compiles them into something. Um, and actually, this uh, another good point is that uh, we can actually have a language without canonicity, like this one, uh, but write a compiler for it, which just works with closed terms and which is kind of not related to the uh, ordinary relation, uh, uh, reduction relation. So it actually computes everything, but it, it's not used in the language itself, it's just some, a compiler. It is quite possible to do this, I think. Um, so yeah, this is one um, of stuff that we want to do in the future. Okay, thank you. We have another question um, from uh, Andy Pitts. Andy, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, Valerie, uh, can you tell me um, the extent to which R and um, goes beyond uh, hot I? And so what I'm thinking of is the relationship between cubicle type theory and say cubicle agda. So, well, so we, know, we know cubicle type theory is consistent logically because it has models. Uh, and the status of cubicle agda at the moment is it's inconsistent. You can prove true equals false in it. Right. Uh, which is unfortunate and I'm sure will be fixed real soon. Um, but does, does Arend have features that, that uh, you know, um, make it yes. a possibility uh, that it might be inconsistent? <laughs> yeah, uh, the, well, first of all, uh, we should consider just the core. And uh, in the core, there are a few features uh, which are not trivial, so to say. So one of them is uh, uh, this one, but much known uh, ADP, it is actually built in, in, in core. So this one, uh, if there are bugs, then um, it, it will reduce, of course, uh, inconsistencies. But uh, again, in principle, it is very uh, simple, just the, just the J rule, but uh, in the form of pattern matching. Another thing is uh, the universes, uh, because there are several uh, non-obvious, non-trivial stuff again built in in core that to universes. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, I mean, th th thanks for the answer. Yeah, so that's, that's, uh, yep. So yeah, uh, actually uh, I thought uh, about formally verifying the core and uh, I don't think that it it will be that difficult. I don't know. Uh, actually, well, anyway, as, as I said, it's not has priority because I think that uh, those additional features are they mostly for efficiency or something like this, so they're not very essential. So the theory itself is actually pretty much the same as this one. So the additional features are just for efficiency, you can say, and stuff like that. Okay, uh, we have a yet we have another question from Andreas Abel. Um, Andreas, you are now unmuted. Right. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Also, I like this R and language uh, has some nice design decision. So, um, do you have any plans to add index types and dependent pattern matching? Uh, as I said, uh, we don't we, no. I, we won't add index data types because, um, I, well, n no. I don't actually. I don't think that it is a good principle because uh, I, I think that um, it just nicely splits into two kinds of definition. One is just the identity type, uh, and the other one is uh, those kind of definitions and. Uh, the class of uh, the types of indices that you can define is actually those are better types of indices, at least I think so. Um, yeah, so no. Okay. Okay, do we have any other questions? There is some discussion on the uh, chat asking whether there was, whether, whether you could you refer, I think you also also mentioned something called the core, whether uh, you could identify a part of the R and implementation that is critical, that is to say that you have to trust it 
and then maybe the rest you don't have to trust or or is it not designed like that but i think you have probably answered that already yeah uh, actually there's uh, just one thing that i want to mention is that uh, yes there's the score it can be checked separately it's not very minimalistic as i said there are few non-trivial parts but uh, one actually important thing is that when you doing this stuff with language extensions of course it's very low level so you can do all kind of crazy stuff but the point is that it's just uh stuff that you can do in the uh, high level language so it's not it's not gonna mess with the core so uh, the core is always um consistent uh well assuming it is implemented correctly okay okay thank you we have another question from uh yulia uh yulia you are now unmuted hey uh thank you so what is the domain for main domain or maybe use cases for uh use an errand because some proof assistants are better in different things and i'm not very familiar with uh cubicle type theory and hot tie so i'm curious uh, where is it good um which domains or use cases are suitable for this um, well, first of all, uh, uh, I think that uh, people interested in homotopy type theory can um, use it because as I said, it has several nice features related to this. And also we want to implement in the future some extensions like um, some uh, like linear uh, type theory or something like this, I don't know. Uh, so, and the second one is uh, is for formalizing uh, mathematics. Um, again, most of the features that we add is uh, I intended to simplify the stuff like this. So for example, tactics or meta definition that we add is again very important. Well, it, it will important anyway in uh, program verification also. But um, yeah, as I said, uh, I didn't say that, uh, but we don't actually plan to uh, add features related to uh, program verification right now. We are focused on mathematics right now, but again, in the future, maybe. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Dan. Dan, you're now unmuted. No, you're not. Uh, no, you're uh, now not. you are, <laughs> now you're not. Can you speak? I, yes, I think I'm okay. unmuted. Okay. Um, so thanks, that was a very nice talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could say what things have been formalized already and also what documentation there is for people who'd like to try out error. Yeah, uh, we have um, about what has been formalized. Uh, so uh, I uh, mostly formalized stuff about uh, that to come out of depth here actually. There are a few things about like ordinary mathematics, like localization of rings, but not too much because I just realized that it is not very convenient to do this without any sort of automation support. So we implement this one and now I can proceed with formalizing some math. And uh, there are a few things, um, as I said, um, related to uh, homotopy theory. So in particular, I formalized uh, not all uh, the paper about uh, modalities but some chunks of it uh, so yeah there are some uh, theory of uh, like effective sub universes modalities that kind of stuff formalized and uh, also the uh, like uh, some facts about joints uh, uh, hope vibration uh, and the biggest one uh, I showed is the generalized Becker's mass theorem again it, it uses uh, uh, effects of sub universes so this is the biggest one i formalized so i think that's about it okay we have a question from josh uh hi yeah uh thanks for your talk i was just wondering could you say a few words about uh where canonicity fails sure um uh, let's mm -hmm. yeah right, right here right here because we have uh a data type with two constructors mm -hmm. and uh, we have eliminator for it but eliminator is defined only on one of those constructors and not on the second one so as soon as you know uh, this function yeah. on the wrong constructor then it's it, it, it'll stuck 
And if I understand, sorry, if, uh, just a quick follow up question. If I understand correctly, the identity type is defined in terms of the path type here, right? So yeah. it's just path, path types. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I did mention that, but this one is actually uh, so called uh, heterogeneous path types. So A here uh -huh. is actually uh, depends on an interval. Uh, and this one is just a special case when A is constant. Okay, we have a question from Mark. I'll try to unmute him, and if it doesn't work, then I'll read his question. Mark, do we hear you? Okay, I'm assuming I'm going not, so I will read his question. Um, can you elaborate on what users are actually allowed to manipulate using normal code and its motivations compared to tactics, e.g. LTAC or MTAC, or things like SS Reflect? Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question, but uh, what uh, users can uh, do with this kind of stuff, I think that's the question. Well, there is so-called ARNT API. This is just part of the, the whole tab checker uh, source code that is uh, you can use to, um, uh, to implement uh, those kind of things. And uh, right now it is kind of small. I mean, the one that was released, but we are extending it currently. Uh, so in the version that was released, you can only define those uh, uh, meta definitions, right? So basically this is just, uh, my definition is just a code that takes uh so so for example let's say we have a rewrite uh tactic right and uh, we can pass some arguments to it and then uh when the checker uh sees that it will involve this uh java code and uh, pass all the arguments to it and also it will uh, uh pass the the checker like context information the tricky type and stuff like that so uh, you can analyze those expressions, analyze context, analyze the type, analyze existing definitions. So find some lemma existing and apply it, for example, or do stuff like that. Uh, so, uh, and also another thing that we're implementing right now is goal solvers. So again, I, I showed that uh, when you have a goal, you can implement an arbitrary solver that again can uh, try to find some existing lemma or whatever, some complicated proof and prove this goal for you. Uh, yeah, th those are the two things that we have right now and we can add more stuff to it later. Um, okay, uh, so Mark again is raising the question, his, his mic is not working, but he's raising again the question of small kernel to errand but I think we've now addressed this twice already. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a, let, let me try to, let me try to summarize it and maybe you can then say I'm totally wrong. So there is, RND is implemented in Java, but you don't have to trust all of it. There is a core, which has some basic features that do the checking and you need to trust that core and then the rest you don't have to, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I hope Mark's happy with that answer. Uh, do we have another question? Oh, uh, Dan also asked you about uh, about documentation. Oh, right. I, I thought that there was some other question. Yeah, yeah uh, there is a site. Uh, uh, you can I know, Google it uh, pretty easily. Uh, the documentation, which is pretty terse, but we also wrote uh, tutorial uh, and we are finishing the second part of the tutorial which just explains stuff like this so yeah um, you can also follow the twitter and we will we announce stuff like uh, that on twitter so if you're interested and uh, just so you know so in the public chat somebody posted uh, a link to the documentation okay. uh, Okay, we have a question from Steve Audi, uh, which I have not, oop, oop. It's, okay, Steve, go ahead. I'm trying to start my video to be polite. 
Um, I'm looking at the paper which describes the models of hot eye. Mm -hmm. And right. one way that you can, is it okay to ask a question about the paper because it's not really in the talk, but sure. Mr. Chair, is that all right? I think what we're going to do is we'll, we'll go with this question and then unless there's another question, we're going to uh, have a first level end of the talk and anybody who wants to stay and chat some more can stay. But uh, so uh, go ahead and ask the question okay, or, or you can okay. wait or you can wait a little bit. I think if you like more time and more discussion. I think this is related to Andy's previous question about. Okay, so go ahead. Why is it so easy to construct a model if usually models are hard to construct? And I mean, uh, oh, continue. It works. I have a specific question. Can I ask it? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. If I understand correctly, the way this works is you first start with a model of univalence in the old fashioned sense. Mm -hmm. And then you use that to build a model of this new system, hot eye. Yes. And then you ask, does that universe model univalence in the new sense? And the answer is no. But mm -hmm. from it, you can construct a model which, under good circumstances, models univalence in the new sense. And then you have to do some more work to get the CoE rules to hold mm -hmm. the, what's called regularity in the cubicle mm -hmm. world to hold. And then my question is that new thing that you jazzed up now to get to model hot eye, the new universe, is it still univalent in the old sense? Uh, yeah, of course, because it is equivalent to the old universe. Okay. Uh, so but you fixed it up in such a way that it's now univalent in the old sense and in the new sense and regular? Yes. Okay. Good. That was my question. That's a good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. um, Go ahead. Yeah, just about uh, difficulty of constructing models. So the most difficult part is just this, those coherence issues, right? And I just used the existing uh, way of solving them if you're wondering the universe construction. Um, so, and the rest is, I mean, pi types, sigma types and stuff like that is interpreting the usual way. And so the most difficult part is the universe, what Steve just now <laughs> described. Basically, the idea of what it works. Lovely. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, maybe we can uh, finish up and uh, have uh, people. Uh, let's have another. Let me unmute everybody. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've muted everybody, but now you can also unmute yourselves. So thanks. Uh, thank you very much for participating. I hope to be able to organize uh, more sessions about more proof assistance and the ideas uh, that are implemented and are hiding in them. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to end the meeting. So if anybody wants to stay around and chat in a slightly more informal way, is welcome to stay. Uh, if uh, all 130 people stay, then we'll have to figure something out. But otherwise, thank you so much for uh, visiting Ljubljana today. Also, I would like to, uh, I forgot this. Uh, uh, in the background, Anja Petkovic, who is also from Ljubljana, was helping me with the co-hosting. So thanks, Anja, for uh, um, helping me manage the, uh, the meeting. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Anytime. Okay. Bye-bye. So, Valeri, maybe you can stay and see if anybody else has any other more specific questions. I, I hope I could see anybody, but... Um, yeah. What's going on? You... Yeah, I, I mean, I just I couldn't see anybody because uh, I don't have the Zoom interface again. Oh, so, you just have the big screen. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, imagine I mean, the typical Skype situation. I mean, I don't see anything at all. Ah, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Stop recording for this part. Yes, good idea. Dan said stop recording. I agree. So I will stop recording at this point because people will... <laughs>